Recently, I was building a CLI application in Go, and I wanted to display a progress spinner for a long-running task. Usually, my first instinct is to reach for a third-party package. However, this time, I decided I wanted to build my own. To do so, I went about it like I normally would, thinking a little about the design before jumping straight into the code. However, after building it for a couple of hours, I still couldn't get it to work, as I kept running into issues caused by concurrency. So I decided to scrap what I had and start again from the beginning. But this time, I was going to use test-driven development. In hindsight, I'm really glad that I did, because this component was a lot trickier than I thought. To get started, I decided to create a new project called Terminal-UI, which I then initialized using the gomod init command, followed by opening it up in my favorite text editor. Once inside, I opened up my telescope file browser and created a new directory and file, both called spinner. This directory would be the spinner package, and this file would contain the main spinner code. Inside of this file, I first defined the package name, followed by creating a new struct type called spinner. Whenever I begin building out a new abstraction, I always start with designing the public interface. By doing so, it helps me understand how I want the component to work, laying the foundation for the actual implementation. When it came to the spinner, the first idea I had was to use a simple start and stop method. Whilst I was initially happy with this design, I did feel like it opened up the spinner to a number of different edge cases, such as what the expected behavior of restarting a stopped spinner was, or what should happen if you call start on a spinner that's already spinning. Despite this, however, I did like this interface design, but I wanted to see if I could simplify it in some way. And so I decided to play around with removing the stop method, instead only having the single method of start. In order to actually stop the spinner, I decided to use a context.context, .context, which would be passed into the start method as a parameter. Whilst this approach was less intuitive, I felt like it removed a lot of code. And so for my initial implementation, I decided to roll with it. Predictably, however, this decision ended up being a mistake. With the interface defined, the next thing to do was to begin implementation, and because I was using TDD, that meant beginning with a test. In order to do so, I created a new Go file called spinner underscore test, and set the package name to be the same. After defining the test package, I then went about writing the code for my initial test function. The way TDD works is you start by defining your test case, and then write the least amount of code in order to make it pass. Once it's passing, you can then go about refactoring your implementation. This is known as the red-green refactor loop, and is actually a really interesting way to build software. The first test case I decided to implement was that after a scheduled period of time, two frames would be printed to the console via SDD error. Unfortunately, this presented a bit of a problem, as we needed a way to capture what had been written to the stream. Whilst there is a way to capture SDD error using operating system pipes, doing so adds a lot of complexity to the tests. Not only that, but because we're patching a global value, then it also has the potential to cause some knock-on effects. So I decided to use another approach. This approach was to define an io.writer property on the spinner, which would default to SDD error. Then in our tests, we could use dependency injection to overwrite this property, allowing us to easily read the value. To enable this, I like to use the constructor pattern, which works by defining a function called new, which returns an instance of the type, in this case, the spinner. Inside of this function, I configure an instance with default properties, which I can override by using dependency injection. When it comes to Go, you can actually do dependency injection via a number of different ways, and I actually have a video plan for the future to look at some of these different methods. In this case, because I was setting default values, then I wanted the injected dependencies to be optional. And so I decided to achieve this by using a new type called config, which itself contained a property of io.writer. This config type would then be passed as a parameter to the constructor function. And if the io.writer was set inside of the config, this value would be used instead of the spinner's default. This approach made it easy for the tests to overwrite this value, whilst also preventing end users from having to pass in a default. As well as a property of io.writer, I also wanted to add in another property for the frame rate, which was of type time.duration, and would be used to determine how fast the spinner would cycle through each of its frames. By default, I set this to be 250 milliseconds, which equaled 4 frames per second. However, I also made this available to be overridden using the constructor's config, 
This made it so that our tests could run quicker, as they could now configure the amount of time it would take for a condition to be met. Lastly, I added another property to the spinner called frames, which was a slice of runes used to represent each individual frame in the spinner animation. Again, I set this to its default value inside of the constructor function, which was set to four ASCII values for lines in various different orientations. When these characters are used as an animation, it gives the appearance of a line spinning in a clockwise direction. With our properties defined and a way to overwrite them, the next thing to do was to go and implement my initial test. Before I move on to how I did that, however, let me first take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org. One of the best things you can do for your own personal development is to learn a little every day, and using a platform such as Brilliant can help you to achieve this. Brilliant has thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Each of these courses on Brilliant encourages you to learn by doing, rather than just by memorization. Additionally, each of the lessons are set up so you can learn a little every day, which makes it easier to exercise your brain, improving your ability to learn, which, when it comes to software development, is extremely important, given how quickly the landscape changes. As well as helping you to develop your learning capabilities, Brilliant also helps you to build real knowledge in just minutes every day, such as with the Thinking in Code course, which will not only teach you the foundations of writing code, but will also teach you essential coding elements, such as loops, variables, nesting, and conditionals. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash dreamsofcode, or click the link in the description down below. You'll also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. A big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now that my spinner had some properties applied to it, I was able to implement my first test. To do so, I instantiated an instance of the spinner with a byte stop buffer and a frame rate of 20 milliseconds. Then I created a cancellation context with a timeout of 25 milliseconds, which would be enough time for the spinner to hit two frames. Then I called the start method, passing in the cancellation context. Afterwards, I then pull out all of the written data from the buffer using the read all function of the IO package. Because this function can return an error, it's worthwhile adding in a check to ensure that this is null. When it comes to testing in Go, I often refer to the stretcher slash testify package for my assertions, which I added to my project using the following goget command. After asserting that the error didn't exist, the next thing to assert was that the data from the buffer contained the expected string. This string consisted of our first and second frame, separated by a backslash b. This backslash b is a special escape character when it comes to the terminal, and is used to move the character back one space. This will cause our spinner to replace each character with the next frame, which will make it appear as if it's spinning. With the test now implemented, I quickly checked that it was working before moving on to implement the code to make it pass. As I mentioned before, when it comes to DDD, the idea is to write the least amount of code in order to make the test pass. Therefore, for the start method, I wrote a simple iterator to iterate over each frame, convert that frame into a byte, and then write the byte to the internal io.writer. Once the frame has been written, the next step is to use the select keyword in order to wait on two different channels. The first channel is the context.done, which if selected means that the context is cancelled and we want to return out of the loop. The second channel is created using the after function of the time package, passing in our frame duration. When this channel is invoked, we want to continue with the for loop to the next frame. Therefore, I'm adding in the following line to break out of the select statement, causing the loop to move on to the next iteration. Before the next frame is printed, however, I make sure to write the backspace character to the internal writer, which will cause the next frame to overwrite the previous character. Next, I check if I've written enough code in order to make sure the test is passing, which I had managed to do, meaning I was able to move on to writing the next test case. Before doing so, however, However, I take the opportunity to refactor the test code, turning it into a parametric or table-driven test, which is commonly used in Go. By doing so, it reduces the amount of boilerplate needed for each test, making it much easier to test different parameters. Once the code has been refactored, the next test I add is to ensure that we get the correct output when we wait for six frames. When I go to run this test, it fails as expected which means I can now implement the code to fix it. Again, by taking the approach of writing the most minimal amount of code for the test to pass, all I end up doing is wrapping the existing for loop inside of another one that will run indefinitely, which is enough for all of the tests to pass. 
Whilst my spinner is working as defined by the tests, because it's a UI-based component, I always find it's worthwhile adding in a visual integration to make sure it works as intended. For this project, I achieve this by setting up a new example application, which starts a spinner, sleeps for 5 seconds, and then stops it by cancelling the context. However, when I went to run the application, it presented a couple of bugs. The first is that the spinner didn't stop running. This was happening due to the spinner blocking the main thread, which meant that the line cancelling our context was never being called. This behavior wasn't being encountered in the tests due to the fact they were using the context.withTimeout method, which meant that the cancellation was happening asynchronously. Therefore, I added in another test to check the asynchronous behavior. This sort of test can sometimes be a little tricky to implement, as you want to make sure that the test also exits and doesn't get stuck indefinitely. My approach to these tests is to run the problematic function inside of a Go routine, which will then close a done channel after the function exits. Then inside of the main test body, I'll use a select statement on both the done channel and a time.after. If the done channel is called, then that means the function exited. However, if the time.after is called, then we can assume that the method is still running and the test has failed. This meant the test would only ever run up to 200 milliseconds before exiting. Once I had the bug recreated, the next step was to implement a solution. For that, I chose to run the entire logic inside of the start function in a go routine, which meant that the spinner would work asynchronously. Upon implementing the solution, my example now worked. However, my tests were now failing. Initially, this was a little confusing, but the root cause ended up being the latency caused by invoking a new Go routine. I was able to solve this by modifying my tests to not use the context.withTimeout method, instead using a time.sleep after starting the spinner, and then calling the context cancel function afterwards. At this point, I was starting to wonder if using a context.context .context was the right decision. The good news was I didn't have to wait too long to find out. When testing the example application to ensure that the code was now working asynchronously, I discovered another minor bug. This was where one of the frames was left behind when the spinner stopped. In order to solve it, I needed to make sure I was clearing the line when the context was cancelled, which meant I needed to write in another backspace character. Before implementing this, I quickly modified the expectations of my existing tests. Then once I confirmed that my tests were failing, I went and added in the following line to make them pass. This line would write in the backspace character once the context was cancelled. However, when I went to run my tests, it didn't work. Neither of the tests had the backspace character printed at the end. Again, I was a little confused. However, after a little bit of trial and error, I realized that the context cancellation function doesn't wait for the work to complete. This meant that the code would continue before the backspace character was written. I was able to validate that this was happening by writing yet another test, one that would wait a couple more frames after cancelling the context, which ended up producing the correct result. Unfortunately, because I had chosen to stop my spinner using a context.context, .context, I was unable to perform any thread synchronization. This was actually a very similar problem I encountered when I wrote my initial implementation, and it was what caused me to start again using TDD. This time, however, I had an idea on how to solve the problem, and I had the tests to validate it. But in order to do so, I needed to implement a stop method. With the method defined, the next thing to do was to modify my tests to make use of it, replacing any calls to the cancel function. Then I went and ran my tests to make sure that they were all failing. Next, I went about implementing my solution, which was actually very similar to what I had already. I started by assigning a property of cancel func to the spinner, followed by creating a brand new context and cancel func inside of the start method. I then assigned this cancel func to the spinner's property, followed by calling this cancel func inside of the stop method. This was actually very similar to what I already had. However, now it was all encapsulated within the spinner. So when I went to run my tests, they were now all passing, except for the ones with the missing backspace character. However, now I was able to implement a fix. I started by adding the most minimal code approach, which was a load-bearing time.sleep with the duration of a single frame. Now, when I went to run my tests, they were passing. However, this was a bit of a hacky solution. But thinking back to the red-green loop, I was now able to make my refactor. The approach I chose to use was to make use of a done channel, which is another idiomatic pattern when it comes to Go. This channel would be created inside of the spinner start method and then assigned to the spinner property. Then this channel would be closed after the final backspace had been written in the context.done method. All that remained now was to make use of this done channel in the stop method, preventing it from returning until it was closed. 
If your brain is spinning at this point, then you're not alone. Mine was also starting to do so as well. Fortunately, I had my test cases to prove that everything was working as expected, which showed that the backspace character was now being added. I also quickly modified my example application to make use of this new stop method, and everything worked as expected. However, I wasn't done yet, as I needed to address the main reason I didn't want to use a stop method in the first place, the associated edge cases. Again, I was going to check these off using TDD, and the first test I wrote was to check what happened if I called stop and a non-started spinner. The expectation here was that nothing should happen. However, instead, my test panicked, caused by a nil pointer dereference. Again, I took the minimal code approach to solve this, which was to check if the done channel was nil and return early if that was the case. This caused the test to pass, so I was able to move on to the next edge case, which was checking what would happen if I called the start method on an already started spinner. Again, my expectation was nothing should happen. Instead, however, it ended up causing two progress spinners to be writing to the same stream at the same time. Again, I solved this using the most minimal code I could, which was to check if the done channel was not nil, which had sort of become the de facto runtime check. If that was the case, then the start function would return early. With this test passing, I was then able to move on to my third and final edge case, which was calling start on a spinner that had been stopped. My expectation for this test was that it should restart from the beginning. However, instead, my spinner refused to restart. This was happening because I wasn't resetting the spinner state inside of the stop method, and so all I had to do was set the done channel to be nil after waiting for it to be closed. With that, all of my tests were now passing and my edge cases had been handled. The last thing I wanted to do was some refactoring, especially as I now had a good picture of how the code worked. The first thing I chose to do was to remove the context parameter of the start method. Given that this was now useless with the stop method, and by using it you could actually cause the spinner to be left in a bad state. After removing it, I also had to make a few changes inside of the test cases. The next thing I changed was to make use of a time.ticker, rather than using the time.after function. There's a very slight difference between the way that these two work. However, the TLDR is that the time.ticker is more consistent. Once I made this change, I then checked that my tests were still passing, which they were. The next thing I wanted to refactor was to add in a private helper method to check if the spinner was running. I added this change just to make the code a little bit more readable, especially as we had ended up using the done channel to perform this check. With the method implemented, I then made the following changes to make use of it in both the start and stop methods. The final change I decided to make was to add in some thread safety using a read-write mutex from the sync package. By doing so, it would help to prevent any race conditions if using the spinner across multiple Go routines. Once added, I verified that everything was working by running my unit tests and checking my example integration. Lastly, all that remained was to initialize a Git repository, add and commit the code, and then push it to a remote repo.